Oh, and actually I'm seeing Mr. McCulloch emailed me and said he's, he's not gonna be able to make it. So he will not be joining. We ready to go? Just waiting for Rick to give us the word and then I'll uh, I'll start with the OPMA announcement. All right, good evening. This is a regular meeting of the Zoning Board of Adjustment for Wednesday, April 6, 2022. Notice has been given in accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act by posting a copy of the notice on the first floor of the municipal building and sending a copy to the Montclair Times, Star Ledger, and Herald News. This is a virtual public hearing. A link for members of the public to join is included in the agenda, which is available on the Montclair website, as is a link to the township's YouTube channel where the hearing can be viewed live or thereafter. The hearing is also being televised live on channel 34. Um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and call roll. Mr. Church? Here. Yeah. Mr. McCulloch is excused. Mr. Moore? Present. Mr. Simon? Here. Mr. Harrison? Here. Ms. Harris? Here. Mr. Caulfield is also excused. Mr. Vieira? Here. Mr. Sullivan? Here. So, so Tommy, I missed that. Do we have seven board members present? We have six. Yeah, we have six currently. Uh, Mr. McCulloch emailed in just before the meeting started. Originally, he said he was going to be in attendance. So we have six six members. Okay, well, we'll have to advise Mr. Trembulak when he get to his case. Okay. Yes. Okay, we have the minutes of the board's meeting on March 2nd. Um, I have just one change uh, at the top of page four, the second line, if you could replace legal proceeds with appeal. Does anyone else have any changes to those minutes? If well, not, would someone like to move the minutes with that change? I'll move the minutes as presented. So as corrected. I strike that as corrected. Then. Second. For a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Um, Mr. Moore, Ms. Harris, uh, both have to abstain from that one. Abstain. And we have the resolution for the property on Greenview Way. I just have a couple changes. Um, in number five of the findings on page one, I think it would be better if we made that into two separate findings. One that the property is located in the potential historic district period, at, you know, after inventory viewer, and then start a new paragraph. And instead of all those say since the improvements and then replace uh, will with was not referred to the Historic Preservation Commission for comment. Um, I don't have any other changes to um, that resolution. Does anyone else have any changes? And if not, does someone want to move the resolution with that, those changes? I'll move the resolution with the amendments. Changes. Is there a second? Second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed and abstentions would be Mr. Moore and Ms. Harris. Abstain. <clears throat> then we have the resolution amending the contract with Mr. Sullivan. I don't have any changes to that resolution, which we received an amended resolution today, and I'm moving the resolution we received today. Um, is Anyone else with any changes to that resolution? And if not, does someone want to move it? I'll move it. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 
Um, let me announce the next application and then we will go from there. Uh, the next application is that of 48 Walnut LLC. This is for property at 48 Walnut Street. This is an application for site plan approval to renovate and expand an existing three family dwelling. Proposed improvements include a new two car garage and a relocated parking area with five surface parking spaces. Property is located in the R2 two family zone and is designated as block 4308 lot eight on the township tax maps. The applicant, in addition to site plan approval, is seeking variance to expand the existing three family dwelling, which is a legal non conforming use. The variance from Montclair Code Section 347 51 to permit a portion of the expanded building to be 35.57 feet high, whereas the ordinance provides for a maximum height of 35 feet. Um, is notice in order and our taxes paid? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Trembulak, um, I don't know if you heard, we are six members tonight. We had a last minute dropout. Um, how do you wish to proceed? Alan, you there? On there's a panelist. I know he was having issues with his audio. He had called in before, but I don't see him calling in anymore. That he was, yeah, he was listed as a participant for a while there. He's still there as a as a participant, um, but I think his audio is maybe not working. Yeah, I'm there, watching the attendee think... list, so if he calls in, I'll unmute him. Michael, can you reach out to him and see what's happening? I can. Okay, Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Yes, and we can see you. <laughs> Finally, that wasn't easy. I apologize. Um, I had connected originally by phone and then my computer connected and then for some reason I couldn't get the audio, but uh, I'm here now. Um, and just for the record, Alan Tremulak appearing on behalf of the applicant 48 Walnut LLC. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I discussed this briefly with my client. We'd like to proceed tonight. Uh, we appreciate the fact that uh, the six board members uh, are here. I think this is a special meeting. Um, and we'd like to proceed, present our case, and then we'll make a decision after we've presented the case whether we ask the bo board to vote tonight or to perhaps defer voting until there's a full complement of seven members. Okay, that is, is that fine. acceptable? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, just by way of a brief opening, um, this is an application for site plan approval uh, and a D2 variance uh, to renovate, improve, and expand the existing three family dwelling lo located on this property at 48 Walnut Street. The property is located in the R2 two family zoning district. But the existing building on this property has been used for many, many years as a three family dwelling dating back to, I think, the 1940s. And consequently, the, the three family use is a legal non conforming use of this property. The house on the property and the property itself are not in the best of condition. Um, the house has aluminum siding, uh, a front lawn which consists of essentially artificial turf and gravel, um, a gravel driveway, a rear yard that is essentially covered with pavement, uh, no striping and very little, if any, green space. Um, as you'll hear from our witnesses tonight, the applicant is proposing to make significant upgrades and improvements to the property including replacing the aluminum siding with new wood or fiber cement siding, removing the artificial turf and gravel and create and replacing that with grass landscaping and a rain garden in the front of the property. Uh, 
also proposing to construct a uh, new two car garage on the property. There currently is no garage, I don't, I believe. Um, add additional five uh, surface parking spaces, create a lawn area in the rear of the, uh, in the rear yard, um, a new paved driveway fencing, and a code compliant trash enclosure. Because we're proposing, also proposing several additions to the building, we consequently need a D2 variance uh, to expand the non-conforming three-family use. The only other variance we need is a very minor height variance. We exceed the maximum permitted height by eight inches. In all other respects, uh, the building uh, and the additions, as well as the site improvements, fully comply with all the bulk requirements applicable to the R2 zone. And we also providing the required number of on-site parking spaces. Um, the improvements will be discussed in detail by the project architects, uh, Paul Sionis and Rick uh, Jarzembowski. Following their testimony, I'll provide a planning testimony from George Williams in support of the variances. And uh, before calling the expert witnesses, I'd like to proceed uh, first by uh, calling my client to provide some brief testimony regarding her plans for the property. So, uh, unless the board has any questions for me at this time, I would call my first witness, which is Alev Erdi, E-R-D-I. All right, Mr. Erdi, would you raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth in the matter pending before the board? Uh, hi, it's Mrs. Erdi. Oh, yes, oh. I do. That, I, you can tell I can't see you. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> okay, there we are. Okay. So, um, and do you, you, you say I do as to the swearing in? I do, yes. Okay, just give us your name and address for the record, please. Uh, my current address is 49 Skyview Terrace, Clifton, New Jersey. And my name is Alev Ardi. And uh, um, so that's it. <laughs> Okay. And I want to thank the board for, you know, hearing our uh, requests and and, um, and hoping that, you know, we can work on this project. Okay. All right, Ms. Erdi, uh, are you the owner of the property located at 48 Walnut Street in Montclair? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you currently own that property in, in the name of a limited liability company known as 48 Walnut LLC. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. Okay. When did you first acquire an ownership interest in this property? 2009. Okay. So you've owned it um, either um, toward, and, and are you the are you the the sole owner of the property at this time? Yes, I am. Okay. You've owned it since 2009 either individually or with other partners. That's correct. Yes. All right. And there's currently an, a three-family dwelling on the property. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. Okay. And you gave your address at, at, at 49 Skyview Terrace in Clifton. So I take it you do not live in this building currently. Uh, is that right? Yeah, I lived in Montclair for 20 years, and recently I had a stroke, and after that, uh, you know, we moved. I moved to Clifton to a small condo, but. Yeah, I want to be back in Montclair, so. Okay. All That's right, so the, prop, the, the, the existing building is currently rented out to tenants, correct? That's correct, yes. Okay. So, um, just um, explain to the board um, why you're seeking to renovate and expand this building, what your intentions are with regard to the building and the future use and occupancy uh, of the building. Okay. Well, you know, I, my kids grew up in Montclair. They are from Montclair High School. They, you know, they have been there. They grew up there and I have been there and I have a lot of friends and I like the culture there. But after my stroke and after my separation, I actually moved to Clifton. But my whole goal was always moving back to Montclair because I can't drive, but I can walk. I need a walkable uh, place. And I have an autistic son. 
who has four or five friends who lives downtown Montclair. And so it would be great for us, you know, to live um, in Montclair in that area, which is very nice. And my other son, uh, who's doing his PhD, he's coming back to uh, work in Manhattan. So, you know, he can live in the other place. That's what our goal is. Basically making it our home and uh, restoring that building to its, you know, to be more beautiful, you know, to its original Montclair architecture, you know, not aluminum siding, but with wood, wood and, you know, basically spending a lot of money so we can actually have a nice place to reside together okay. and where we lived before and where we were happy before so okay so your plan is to um ultimately move into this house and then the other two um dwelling units would be rented out perhaps you know to your son or other family member but otherwise that's to other tenants is that right that's correct yes okay um now you um you were present when um the development review committee um considered this project correct mm -hmm. that's correct okay. and um do you recall at that meeting that um a uh, a neighbor uh, expressed some concerns regarding maintenance of the property in particular that trash cans were left out at the curb and were not taken in after trash collection that's correct yes okay yeah and, and those were valid complaints or concerns is that right that's correct yes all right and have you done anything to um address those concerns um since that uh, development review committee meeting yeah i hired my first floor tenant to make sure that all the trash cans are back in place um you know given that i can't drive so you know I couldn't drive for a long time. Now I can drive, but then like, so I, you know, I need someone who's there, who's making sure that things are taken care of. Okay. And you're paying him to do that? Yes. All right. And have you, have you tried to monitor the property since you, um, you know, engaged the tenant to take care of the trash cans? And... Basically, I ask for a picture of it uh, every Monday and every Thursday. Or, you know, I, I ask them like, okay, are the fish cans back in place? Did you place them? So that's what I did. I, I monitor it remotely, yes. Okay. And is it your intention to continue that arrangement uh, at least until the time when you might move into the property in the future? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, I think that's all I have. Uh, Mr. Chairman. And here, Bill. Do any board members have questions for this witness? No questions. Okay. No questions by me at this time. Okay, are there any members of the public who have questions for this witness? And this is just an opportunity to ask questions. Um, we're gonna unmute your microphones. Um, and if you're watching on the U Montclair YouTube channel or on channel 34 and you wanna call in, um, the number is there on the screen on the agenda. You should um, call in and quickly and ask your questions. Well, at, this, at this time, there's no attendees. Okay, we'll just give, in case there's anyone watching on the um, YouTube um, or on channel 34, um, this is an opportunity to call in and ask a question. Um, Is there, I 
Hearing no one calling in or seeing no one calling in, uh, Mr. Trembulak, you want to call your next witness? Yes, thank you. Uh, Paul Sionis. Mr. Sionis, would you raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth in the matter pending before the board? Paul, you're muted. Oh, you're still on mute. Still muted? Okay. No, there, there you go. Okay. Sorry. All right, Paul, to you raise your right hand, do you swear to tell the truth in the matter pending before the board? I do. State your name and address, please. My name is Paul Sionis. My address is 8 Hillside Avenue, Montclair, New Jersey. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I'm offering uh, Mr. Sionis as an expert in the field of architecture. Um, so obviously testified this before this board numerous times. We just kept accept his qualifications. We'll accept him as an expert architect. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Paul, um, uh, you and other people in your office prepared the site plan and architectural plans for this application? Yes. Okay. And you're prepared to, to review those plans for the board with the board tonight? Yes. And as has become your practice, um, I believe you prepared a, a PowerPoint to assist with your pre presentation this evening. And I see uh, Tommy has already pulled that up onto the screen. Um, do we need to mark that? Um, yeah, yeah, just we're, we're going to identify that's the PowerPoint presentation prepared by Sionis Architecture dated March 2, 2022. That will be exhibit A1. Thank you. All right, Paul, you want to um, review the plans uh, utilizing the PowerPoint and discuss them with the board? Uh, sure. Um, PowerPoint consists of about 17 slides. Uh, I'll, I'll walk through the first six and uh, I'll jump ahead to number 13. And then Rick Jarzembowski, who works with me, um, will start at slide six to explain in detail what um, additional information. So, so slide number one is is the survey map that was prepared by Lakeland Surveying uh, in June of 2021, and um, in the center of the slide is is the property which is 48 Walnut Street, which is known as Lot 8 and Block 4308. Property is uh, 94 feet wide, 150 feet deep, and it's 13,388 square feet or 0.3 acres. Uh, it's it's on the North side of Walnut Street, the property slopes from the back left to the front right corner. So from the uh, northwest corner to the front southeast corner, it slopes down by almost seven feet in height. Um, the lots improved with an existing two and a half story frame building uh, that contains three existing dwelling units. Uh, just to the left or west side of, of the house is an asphalt driveway leading from Walnut Street at the front or south to the rear of the property and at the rear of the property is an existing asphalt and gravel parking area that has space for approximately seven vehicles from uh, west to east across the back. Uh, as, as Alan stated, the front yard is covered with artificial turf. Uh, there's also crushed stone or gravel along the, the east side of the property. Uh, next slide, please. Slide number two. Slide number two is a photograph uh, from the Montclair Planning Department memo uh, dated December 2021. This is a photograph of the front of the existing building. Um, as you can see, the, the building is located on the north side of the street. It's a two and a half story building that's completely clad with aluminum siding. Uh, according to the township records, uh, the tax records, it was built around 1864. 
And then uh, there's correspondence in the code enforcement department that goes back to the 1940s uh, that requested that upgrades be made to the existing three unit dwelling to comply with tenement housing requirements at that time. So that, that's in the um, building department files. Uh, the building can currently uh, contains three apartments, one on each floor. Uh, next slide, please. Slide three. Uh, slide three contains two photographs, again, from the Montclair Planning Department memo from December. Uh, the top left uh, photograph shows the existing rear yard. So you can see that that rear yard uh, is, is both paved with asphalt, it's unstriped, and uh, from left to right in that photograph, which is from the west to the east, it accommodates approximately seven vehicles side by side, parking head in uh, towards the north property line. Uh, the bottom photograph is the rear yard, um, and it shows that um, the rear yard is primarily gravel the, uh, to the left side of the house, which is the east. Uh, that's also gravel, and you can see that the entire building is, is clad with aluminum siding. Uh, next slide, please. Slide four. Slide four, the exi existing floor plans. Um, so as you can see, there's an existing basement. First floor has uh, an apartment with three um, uh, three bedrooms. Second floor has an apartment with three bedrooms. And then the, the attic floor has a one bedroom apartment. Um, so this is uh, the three units in the building that probably have existed uh, at least since the 1940s based on the township records. Uh, slide number five, please. Uh, top left of this slide is the, the township zoning map. The center is the tax map. And then the top right is an area map. Um, so the property, uh, as you can see from the zoning map on the left, it's located in R2, two-family zone. It's about 162 feet from Walnut Parkway, which is the closest street to the right or to the east. Um, that's 477 feet uh, from Grove Street, to, which is directly to the west. Uh, the properties on both sides of this lot um, are all are improved with two-family dwellings. And then uh, based on that area map photo on the top right, you can see that the first Montclair house, the senior residence, is located about 48 feet to the west of this subject property. Uh, next slide, please. Slide six. Um, so this is a, a, a colored site plan. So it's the same site plan that's in your package, except this is colored for better visibility. And um, basically, our office was retained to improve the site, improve the building, improve the three dwelling units, um, provide a, a two-car attached garage, and five exterior parking spaces. We're required to have seven parking spaces for the, these three units. So we're providing seven parking spaces. Um, Mrs. Erdy also asked us to provide outdoor space for each dwelling unit, um, remove the artificial uh, turf from the front yard, remove the, the gravel on the east side of the property, the gravel from the rear yard, uh, which is the north side, install landscaping, install uh, wood fencing to create private yards, new wood fencing around the perimeter of the property, also install a, a trash enclosure uh, for the first time. So we're proposing three trash and recycling enclosures. And um, we're proposing a new asphalt drive along the west side of the drive uh, of the property. Um, so the proposed two-car garage is um, at the front um, bottom left of the building in the darker brown. Uh, and then we're proposing to remove the existing driveway, create a new driveway along the west side of the property uh, to access that two-car garage, and then to access two parallel parking spaces along the east side of the driveway, and then three parking stalls in the back. Um, I'm going to ask Tommy to jump ahead to the um, slide number 13, and then Rick uh, Jarzembowski will come back uh, to slide six uh, to continue. Um, so part of, part of this is the, uh, was a landscape plan that was um, uh, basically no landscaping on the property now. Uh, the, the round uh, green circles that you see uh, along the property line, those are, those are on the adjoining property. Uh, so the idea of this landscape plan is to 
uh, provide year-round interest, provide some screening, evergreen screening. Um, so there's evergreens at the north side of the um, the three new parking stalls, uh, but that will be uh, adjoining a new six-foot high uh, wood fence along the property line. Um, uh, the, there'll be private yards for the um, two of the residents, uh, and you know, and Rick will talk about the uh, we're proposing patios for each of uh, for the two residents. Um, and then there'll be uh, two red maple trees that are marked as AR. Um, and then proposing various uh, planting around the perimeter of the building. All of the planting is, is native. Um, and then the civil engineer, Paul Anderson, uh, designed a, a rain garden to collect all of the uh, storm water from the, the, the roof, roof leaders and from the uh, new asphalt paving. Um, so basically, the rain garden will collect water from the, the asphalt paving on the left or west side, in addition to water from the roof. Um, and then um, uh, the rain garden basically is a, a depressed area, there's this front right corner of the property. Um, and um, according to the civil engineer's drawings, it'll uh, be 1.4 feet lower uh, at the main sort of kidney shaped portion of this rain garden, then the adjoining lawn area. And then um, I discovered that there is a, a rain garden manual for New Jersey that the Native Plant Society of New Jersey published in 2005. And they, they have uh, specific guidelines for planting within uh, the rain garden based on the amount of uh, sun exposure and the type of soil. So we have almost full uh, sun exposure and the soil is, is clay soil here. So all of the, the plant selections for this uh, rain garden were based on um, this uh, rain garden manual for New Jersey. Um, there, there's several small trees that are proposed for the front of the property, including a, a, you know, a flowering dogwood tree, which is the CF on the left side um, to the front left of the house. Center to the left of the front walkway is a, is a red bud tree. And then there's a um, yellowwood tree uh, labeled CK um, to the right of the rain garden. And then, like I said, around the perimeter of the, the house, uh, a variety of, of plants that are native to New Jersey. But the point is to provide year-round interest. Um, so it's not just spring flowers, but um, there's going to be something happening here uh, with the evergreens throughout the winter and then spring, summer flowers plus fall color to the planting. Um, Tommy, if we could go back to slide six. Well, we'll, well before you do that, um, I uh, just had a question. The, the plantings that are shown on the um, easterly side, are those existing, new, or a combination? Everything on the easterly side of the house are existing trees on the neighboring property. So okay. those, those green circles are, are trees on the neighbor's property. What about the two? um you know larger i'm going to call them circles that are shown in the rear behind so the house. rear those are the two red, uh, october glory red maple trees that would um provide shade for the um or canopy for the rear yard of this property partially over the patio spaces and and those are are new those are those are new anything with the the initials are are new and they're keyed into the plant schedule okay okay All right Thanks. You were going to go back to what? Back to slide six. Okay. Okay. And I'm going to turn it over to Rick Jarzembowski, who works with me, who's going to walk the board through uh, the rest of the, the slides. And Before you do that, Paul, I just have three quick questions. Sure. Um, now, and, and I know that Rick will identify the small height variance that we're seeking regarding the building height. Other than that, uh, minor height variance, do, does the site plan comply with all of the bulk requirements for the R2 zoning district? Yes, it does. All right, and I think you already mentioned this, but I'm gonna just ask to make sure that um, the, the number of parking spaces provided on this plan comply with the township zoning ordinance and also the RSIS requirements? 
Right, it complies with the New Jersey Residential Site Improvement Standards Code, which is more stringent than the township requirements. Okay, and do these plans, these plans were revised subsequent to the meeting before the De Development Review Committee, correct? That is correct. And do the plans address the, um, the comments expressed during the DRC meeting? They, they do, there are uh, four, uh, well, three comments that the DRC made. One was to make the lights more muted to avoid glare into the neighbor to the west. Um, number two was to explore a snow storage area, explore adding a, a gate or removable fence to allow snow dumping on the rear yard of the western unit without having to go through parking stalls. Uh, the third was to add a note to the drawings that existing gravel within the front right of way is to be replaced by a grass lawn, either seed or sod. So the drawings have been uh, revised to comply with um, those comments. There was a fourth comment. Um, I don't think it's pertinent to the drawings, but the fourth comment was note that trash management management has been an issue for neighbors in the past. Right. Uh, so. Okay, and speaking of that, I was gonna ask you, um, to just mention or identify where it's located, namely the trash enclosure that's included in these plans. Yes, so um, there are three trash recycling enclosures uh, to the right where the cursor is. Thank you, Tommy. Um, three rectangular gray boxes, which are um, um, wood or composite um, trash and recycling enclosures. Um, they're each 66 inches wide, uh, 36 inches deep, 60 inches high, and they have uh, roofs on them. Um, and they're on a concrete base as required by the township. Okay. Um, where, where, are those, where are those enclosures located? Excuse Tommy, me. could you point to those again? Right where Tommy's cursor is. Got it, okay, thank you. All right, um, that concludes my direct for Mr. Sion. As, as he's already indicated, we're gonna have Rick Jarzembowski discuss the remainder of the uh, slides on the PowerPoint. Do you want to take questions from Mr. Sionis now or wait until they've, we've completed? Wait, 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 wait till Rick does it and then we'll ask, because I suspect the questions are gonna overlap between the two of them. Great, that's what I expected. Okay, um, and I would call Rick Jarzembowski. Mr. Jarzembowski, would you raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth in the matter pending before the board? <laughs> and you'll need yeah, to I'll unmute be. yourself. There we go. Yeah, I do. Okay, state your name and address, please. Uh, Rick Jarzembowski, 8 Hillside Avenue, Montclair, New Jersey. Okay, Rick, um, I'm not sure um, whether you've testified before this board before. Why don't you just briefly um, provide the board with your educational background and your um, professional qualifications and experience? Okay, I graduated with a Bachelor of Architecture from NGIT in 1981, and I received my architectural license in the state of New Jersey in 1985. And I've been with Sionis Architecture for 36 years. Okay. And I've prepared many of the plans that have come before this and other boards in Canada. Okay. Mr. Chairman, his qualifications are accepted. Yes. Okay. All right, Rick. Um, would you um, continue discussing the plans, I guess, beginning with um, the proposed uh, um, improvements shown on slide seven? Okay. Okay, on, on the left side is the basement plan. Um, right now, the basement is storage and utility area. Um, it will remain for those functions, but in addition to that, um, there will be two family rooms located down there in a powder room, and that will be for the 
right now there's one unit on, uh, one unit on the first floor and a separate unit on the second floor. So we're going to change that so that the two units are now two story plus basement units. So they're now vertical units instead of just horizontal units. And that unit one and unit two will each have a family room uh, in the basement. And then all three units will have a storage area uh, that's accessible by a common stair at the front of the basement. Um, the basement itself is not being expanded. And on the right side is the first floor plan uh, where basically the existing house is being surrounded uh, by additions to expand the footprint. And at the lower left-hand corner is a two-car garage, um, two separate units um, that will be used by most likely one for unit one and one for unit two. Um, just to the right of those garages is the main entrance to the building, uh, which will remain off of Walnut Street as it is now. Um, so that is the entrance, the main entrance for all three units. And on the uh, left side of the first floor is uh, unit number one, the first main level of unit number one, uh, which will have a bedroom or study or the other and the living, dining, kitchen area. And the same thing on the right side, unit number two. And then each one of those units will have a stoop and steps down to a rear patio with a fenced private yard. So unit number one and unit number two will each have a private fenced yard uh, behind the dwelling. Um, next slide, please. Okay, on the left side is the second floor. So this is the second level of units one and unit two. And each one of them uh, have three bedrooms on this level. Um, unit one also has a study on this level and several bathrooms and uh, laundry areas. And then on the right side of the page is the separate unit number three, which is a one level unit. And this is um, a three bedroom unit with a very open living dining area. And this unit doesn't have direct access to a private rear yard. So we're providing a roof deck at this level for unit number three so that they have a dedicated outdoor space. Um, next slide, please. So these are the building uh, proposed building elevations. On the right side is a historic photograph that our office uh, was able to obtain from the Montclair History Center. Um, we don't know what date this was taken, uh, but obviously before any of the modern improvements that are there now. And it, it shows a mixture of siding styles and shutters in uh, the original porch. So we took some of our, you know, facade cues from this historic photograph. Um, we know that under the existing aluminum siding, there is some clapboard siding, but we don't know what kind of shape it's in and whether it can be reused or not. Uh, if it can be reused, we would like to do that. Uh, if not, we'll duplicate, um, you know, the style and exposure of that siding. So uh, the top elevation is a Walnut Street elevation or South elevation. And um, in the center is the existing gable um, and with the existing window pattern. And from the historic photograph, what the existing shingle um, siding is in that gable, which we would hope is there. But if it's not there, we plan to uh, duplicate what it was originally. Um, on the right side of that upper south elevation, I'm sorry, on the left side is the new garage with living space above it. Um, again, trying to replicate uh, and be sympathetic to what was originally there. Um, the lower elevation is the east elevation. And uh, again, just trying to keep in the style of the house as it originally was. Um, 
Next slide, please. Okay, so on the on the top is the rear elevation, where at the third level or attic level, um, you can see the the deck for that third unit with a sliding door to that deck. And down at the first floor, uh, sliding doors again to stoops and steps, which lead to those private rear yards. Um, the lower elevation is the west elevation, which faces the driveway. On the right side is the two-car garage. And in the center um, is an extension of the existing gable that's there. And that's where the height variance is. We want to match what that existing gable is, which is about 35 foot eight above <coughs> average grade, which is two feet below the main gable, the higher gable, which you can see uh, runs from side to side or north to south. Um, we just felt like it was better to match that gable than to kind of artificially lower it down eight inches and have a kind of odd roof protection. Um, Again, you know, with the, the siding materials, the window casings, the roofing and everything, we're trying to stay as true as we can to what was originally there. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is the site plan showing the exterior lighting proposed. Um, as mentioned previously, uh, when we were before the DRC, there was a concern about glare into neighbors' uh, properties. Uh, if they were like, looking out the window, could they see the fixtures? So the fixtures along the driveway, we have replaced with uh, a fixture that has total front shield that the light source is pointing down. It's not visible looking at it horizontally um, unless you were looking up directly at the bottom of the fixture. Uh, and we're providing the half foot candle uh, illumination along the majority of the driveway, except for at the, the very rear, which is, you know, the parking stalls themselves. Uh, and then we are providing also some, you know, residential type fixtures um, at the building entrances. And the next, I think that's it. That's it for me. Okay, um, so just um, one second, Rick. Um, sure. Just with respect to the the building height, which again you're proposing to more or less match what's there, which requires a uh, height variance for the additional eight inches. Um, What's the height of the existing building before any additions or improvements are made? Right. The highest point of the existing building is 37 foot 9 inches. Okay. So the existing building height is non-conforming. Correct. Right. Okay. Yes. And that and that's about 2 feet higher than the highest part of the addition that we're proposing. Okay. 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 Um, thank you, Rick. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman, for both of the architects. Okay. So um, this is an opportunity for members of the board. If you have questions for either uh, Rick or Paul, uh, Jay, do you have any questions? Yes, I have uh, one question. I don't know whether they can answer or not, but I'm con how many units are going to be rented? And how many are going to be maintained by the family that owns the building? I'm not clear on that. The way uh -huh. I heard it said was that they're taking one, two floors, or uh, my point is how many units are going to rent? Um, I, I think I can answer that, uh, Mr. Church, based upon my client's testimony. The intention is that. Um, she is going to occupy one of the three units and the other two units would be rented. She's hopeful that her other son may um, rent one of the other two units, but that's that's uh, undetermined. 
you know, but she would occupy one unit and the other two would be rental units. So if her son, if her son didn't move in and rent the one unit, then it would just go to general rental. Correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Sister Moore, do you have any questions? No questions at the moment. Thank you. Mr. Simon, do you have any questions? Yeah, uh, my questions are in regard to the to the backyard. Uh, first off, is from the diagram, it doesn't look like there's any access for unit two from the driveway. Is that correct? Their only path is either through the house or on the east side, um, walking through the grass. Uh, yeah, that that's right. Their access is either from the east side or from uh, inside the unit. Um, so if 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 their only outside access is on the east side, um, is there any lighting or or a walkway to get back there? No, because we would feel that they would come from inside the unit into the backyard. That the, the access really on the east side, we thought was more just for you know lawnmower maintenance, that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, the second question uh, regarding the AC units, why why not match the two unit stack as opposed to having it offset like you do on for unit one? Um, we could, it's just, you know, along the driveway is, um, I think less obtrusive than being at the rear yard. Um, and one of those, at least one of those units will be for the third floor, probably the one by the garage. Um, right. But I'm saying for the two, just even just in terms of uh, either symmetry or simplicity, it, it just seems that unit two is kind of being shortchanged in a, in a regard. Because, you know, um, that's just my opinion. So I'm just curious about that. Uh, the third question is in regard to the snow storage area. So the, the intention is to move the snow, obviously during the winter months, directly onto units, unit one's yard space. Correct. It, we, um, before we met with the D DRC, we had it in the front. And uh, the board engineer felt that that was not an ideal location and preferred that it be in the rear. Um, so that we changed the location to the rear and we're showing a removable section of fence because each one of those yards is fence um, that could be removed so that the snow can be plowed there if necessary. And who would remove that? Would that be the the people plowing the snow or the resident who would be yes. responsible for that the people plowing the snow when they were contracted for that removal they would know you know what the situation was i i, I can anticipate some issues there um that's all i have for now thank you um miss harris do you have any questions um, yes. Um, what's, what's the lot coverage with all of the additions? Um, the principal building coverage is 24.7%. And the impervious coverage is 54%. Okay. Um, I think I have more of a comment than anything. And um, it, it, it seems like there is a lot, there is a lot of bulk being added to this building. Mm -hmm. And the way that the, the facades are treated, it, it no longer reads as a, you know, a three family or a multifamily dwelling. It just looks like a building, like an apartment building. Um, and I'm wondering if you had some, if you looked at this some other way, especially the south elevation, um, 
with the with the garage elevation and the entrance elevation, they, they kind of are competing for dominance, and it, it just makes the building look bulkier um, than it should for this location. Um, I don't. Do you want me to respond to that, or is that? Oh yeah, just, my, my question. Yeah. My question is: Did you consider any other um, configurations of the floor plans to kind of relieve the the, the issues with the bulk of the building? Yeah, we always look at you know several different floor plans and you know uh, elevation choices, but you know to achieve the square footage that was desired and to add the garages into the bulk of the building. Um, you know, we felt this was the best solution. I think also whenever you look at an elevation, you know, in a 2D um, flat drawing, it's deceiving on how large it, you know, looks because there's a lot of stepping back on that south facade. Okay, well, so so just to get this right, the, the portion where the garage is housed, that's the the frontmost or the foremost um, portion of the building. And I'm yes. that's back behind it. Okay, all right, thank you. Mr. Vieira, do you have any questions? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask a question regarding the impervious surface. So what is the overall impact of the impervious surfaces on this project? So I, am, I understand that you're removing some of the um, paved areas in the back, but you're adding roof coverage. So what, what, what is the overall impact? Tommy, could you turn to page to slide 12? Rick, do you want to walk through that? Um, I, I can't read it on my screen. Today. Oh, okay. I, I could answer it. So, so the existing impervious curve uh, coverage is 5,955 square feet or 44.49% of the property. Um, the proposed impervious coverage would be 7,300 square feet. Uh, which increases the impervious coverage to 54.6%. And then uh, Mr. Anderson, the civil engineer, designed the rain garden. If we turn to slide 14, Tommy, please. Um, maybe if we can, if you can enlarge that a little bit so you could read on the left side. Um, so he designed the and I can't testify for him, but he designed the rain garden to accommodate um, the additional impervious coverage. So as you can see, uh, there's 1,640 square feet of new impervious coverage proposed, and he designed that rain garden uh, to accommodate that additional impervious coverage. And again, I apologize, he's, he's not here to testify, but. Yeah, and maybe I can jump in. Um and I was going to mention this in a few minutes anyway, but um, yeah, I was not preparing to present any testimony from the site engineer, Mr. Anderson, because there's been extensive back and forth um, with um, comment letters from the board's engineers, uh, engineer and responses and plan revisions from um, Mr. Uh, Anderson. And I believe all of the board engineers comments have been addressed and I would stipulate on the record on behalf of the applicant that the applicant will comply with all um, either has complied if the, if the applicant hasn't she will comply with all of the comments and recommendations contained in all the uh, board engineers reports okay thank you Mr. Trent Black and uh, I guess the the uh, other follow-up questions. So, if if the engineer 
will now be testifying. I, I would like to ask a question regarding the parking space um, uh, in, in the back. So you have uh, noted parking spaces one, two, and three. So I just wanted to understand um, what was the um, the design rationale for um, like turning um, the car. So it, it, we will expect that those cars will do a K turn or how that um, was considered. Uh, yes, we discussed that at the DRC meeting also that, um, you know, it was a choice between having them do a K turn or, you know, maybe have to, you know, make an extra turn or providing kind of um, a more of a turning space, which would take up part of unit number one's rear yard. And, you know, since these will be tenants, or the owner who will be using these spaces and will be very familiar on how to maneuver here. Um, we decided that it was best to, you know, just have a K turn instead of providing an extra turning space to the uh, right of parking spots one, two, and three, because that would decrease the, the yard available and have more impervious surface. So that that was the rationale on why they're located the way they are. Okay, thank you. So Rick, just following up on that, is there sufficient room for a car to make a K turn and to pull straight out onto the street? Um, I assume, like I installed one, two, and three, that they will pull in to those spaces, and then they have twenty-four feet of backup. So they would back up all the way, the 24 feet, and then make the K turn to leave. Um, and then, you know, on space number four, the parallel space that they would pull ahead, make the K turn and then go out. And on uh, parallel space uh, number five, that they would back up by the garages and make their turn. And then, of course, the two garage spaces can just pull in and out and turn and go out. Okay, so you think that the cars could um, maneuver so that they could pull straight out on rather than back out onto Walnut Street? Right, they, they, okay. they can turn around in that space behind right. the parking and, space. And even if they couldn't, the driveway would function just like most other driveways in town where cars typically back out don't have room to make a k-turn or turn around on the site would back out onto the street they could but you know it, it will take a couple of turns but they certainly can turn around within okay. the site. okay uh just just to follow up on that uh what is is there a barrier on the left side on the west side of the driveway, is there a curve or? There, there is a curve. The, the, the entire parking area is uh, surrounded by a Belgian block curve. So would, would somebody have enough room to turn into the parking, to the parking garage number one? How would they make a K-turn if there's a vehicle on the, on the second parallel space? That seems very tight. I'm sorry, leaving which space? So if there was a car parked in that space where the arrow is, thank you, Tommy. Uh -huh. If there's a car parked there, the person, the person driving into the garage number one, the, the north garage, they, there's no way they can make a K-turn out or even in. They could only come in and go in head first, and they would have to back out the same way if a car is in that space. It if somebody pulls into garage space number one, the, you know, head first, they can back up and then be next to parking space number five. Th there's a 12 foot wide driveway there that they would back into and then proceed out to Walnut Street. Okay. 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 Um, 
Let, let me continue with uh, parking because I'm still not sure. There's, besides the Belgian block, there's a fence along the property line. Yes. So, yes. There, so there's a limit to how far, I mean, the front of the car can actually hang over the Belgian block on the western side when they're doing the K-turn, is that correct? Yes. Um, has, has anyone done anything with turning maneuvers as to determine the feasibility of getting from any of the spaces um, so they're facing forward coming out or? Um, um nobody has put uh like standardized turning radiuses no okay um let, let me uh okay so the the follow-up on what mr tremulak asked in terms of the engineering memo i want to go over that the first the first part of it is really to answer mr vieira's question i I mean, the engineer reviewed the revised plans and determined the great rain garden was adequately sized uh, for the increased impervious surface. So I think we can accept that. But now I want to go over the remainder of the comments. And the second comment concerns the average building elevation and deals with a discrepancy in the height. And I want to understand what is the correct current elevation and then what is proposed and we'll finish with the memo so we can keep that up but then i want to go back and look at the elevations and understand where the high point is currently and where the high and where the proposed uh addition that's exceeding the 35 feet is but let's start here with what, what are the correct dimensions in terms of the existing height of the building. Right. Um, if we could go to the elevation sheet, I think that's where to look at it. Then, um, the, uh, the prior slide. Yes, thanks. I also have the actual plan set, the architectural plans, if you'd like those instead. Yeah, I, I think that would be better. Thank you. You just may need to guide me where to zoom in on the sheet. Yeah, unfortunately, that's not the latest. Um, but the, the average, you know, there was revised plans. But the average grade is 254.67, which is three foot seven and one quarter inches below the first floor. And then the height of the proposed addition is 35 foot eight above average grade. And the existing building height, the main ridge is 37 foot nine inches. Okay. Now those are different numbers than the discrepancy that the engineer's memo points out, which further confuses me as to, um, and then the, I guess, but let me go back to, you indicated there were revised plans that different from what uh, Tommy put on the screen and what what is the plans that accurately shows the both the existing height and the proposed height? What is their revision date? The revision date is February 27th. And it, the only change on that drawing was to show the 
the building height calculation. Tommy, do we have those plans? The latest one that I have in the file is dated February 22nd, which was the revised plans that we got after the first set that we got on um, October 28th. Oh, any one of you were those plans submitted to the board? So these these are the plans that the latest plans that I have. No, and I mean that's I mean that's what you provided to the board. Right. Alan Paul. Fat. <laughs> I'm looking at the latest set that was again dated February 21st. There are two revision dates in the box on the top right. Um, and as Rick said, the only difference was the height calculation. I, I, don't, I don't know if maybe uh, that sheet was just submitted to the engineer to address. But, I mean, but, I but, but if it was, so the memo we have from the engineer is using different numbers than those and pointing out there was a discrepancy. Right. Our numbers are, the architecture numbers are still the same. Well, you just said 35 feet, 8 inches and 30 was the proposed and 37 feet, 9 inches was the existing and neither of those numbers are what's in the engineer's memo no they they are it's just one's one's, one's inches decimal. And one's, yeah one's decimal um it's the same value okay 37.75 and 35 feet eight inches 35.67 okay, 35.67 okay so okay so those okay so that matches up But the board doesn't have plans that show that those no. height. Well, yeah, the, the board has the plans that shows those heights. It just doesn't have the additional information that shows the calculation. Okay, well, can you, Tommy, can you put those elevations up and Rick, can you go over those? Sure. Mr. Chair, just before Rick does that, I just wanted to mention, I don't know if you, the board has it, but um, there is a letter from Mr. Anderson um, responding to the March 2nd um, memo from the board engineer and paragraph two of Mr. Anderson's March 2nd letter states that the project architect has calculated the average grade and we have verified it to be 254.67 feet. Oh, okay, now that was, that was provided to us, but I'm not sure. But I'm not sure that answers the question that was in the engineer's Memo. Okay. Can, can we go back to the elevations? And this may be simple if I understand where we're calculating to and what's shown on these plans. Okay. So you know, we went around the building in 10 foot intervals to get the average. I understand how you calculated the average okay. building elevation. I'm trying to find out how, how given that where the high point is existing and where okay. the high point is in what's proposed. Uh, Tommy, can you enlarge that top left south elevation? Even, even more, but and to the left. 
a little left. Okay, it's loading a little bit slowly. That's okay. Um, and maybe, yeah, where your cursor is on the top left. Rick, do you want to go through? This? Yeah. That shows it pretty well. Where it says exist on the left side, it says existing building height plus 37 foot 9 inches. And then that dot dash line goes across at that level. And it shows that existing center gable. That's the high point of the building. So that is the existing high, you know, highest point building height. And then over the garage, which is the gable on the right side, and the perpendicular gable that faces west, those are 35 foot eight which is the eight inches above the 35 foot requirement. And that gable that is perpendicular to what we're looking at, that faces west, that is the existing height of that gable. And that's what we wanted to match with the addition. That gable in the center, that's existing. There's no addition proposed that high. Okay, so, and then other than from the south elevation, is there any other, okay, I assume then from the east elevation that high point on the addition is visible, is that correct? Or is visible? I'm not sure. Yeah, if you, well, I think if you scroll up higher, Tommy, to the top right, Yes, the so the dot dash line um, at the top of that gable roof on the on the right side there that that's the existing um, thirty eight thirty five feet eight inches. Okay, and would would that height be visible from any of the other elevations? The gables that are facing east and west, you know, which are existing at the 35 foot eight are visible from the back and front. You know, you, you can see the top of the ridge. If that's the question, I'm not sure. Well, you. Looking at the plans, I may answer my own question. Um, what okay, since you tell me, since you're on your memo, um, can you? I'm done without the height. Um, the can you go to page six of your memo? Okay. There are two trees on the property that are shown along the eastern property line on the edge of the existing parking, and it's not clear from your plans what's becoming of those two trees. Um, you testified there are a bunch of trees on the neighbor's property along that property line, but these two trees are clearly on the, the subject property. And you testified you're putting two um, maples in the new rear yards, but it's not clear from the plans what's becoming of these two trees. Right, I'm looking on the survey, and those are not shown on the survey map. And if they are, they're shown on the neighbor's property. Uh, so if we look at the. Yeah, if we look at the first slide again, and uh, if we go to the first slide, Tom. But, but the, the survey shows the chain link fence. On, on our side of that tree, correct? And you see that tree. Um, no, it shows the. 
I'm sorry. Go, go, you have to go back to the picture. All right. It shows the tree to the left or to the west of the chain link fence, correct? Right. And the chain link fence looks to be close to the property line. Right. The chain link fence is on the neighbor's property line. Is on the neighbor's property. But, but very, you know, it. Right. Very close. I mean, it looks to me based on where the fence is in relationship to the property that those two trees are entirely or close to entirely on the subject property. Correct. So I, I based on that, I, I would propose that those two trees are, are to be removed and we would get permission to remove those two trees. Uh, I'm sorry, but the one on the right is definitely on the neighbor's property and it's a, uh, you know, I don't remember the one on the left, but the one on the right is, I know it's on the corner in the neighbor's property. But yeah, as we said in the photograph, it looks like the chain link fence is on the other side of that tray. And it's I mean, I went to the site and it clearly is on the, you know, on the east side of the fence. Are you right? Over Maybe it's, yeah, it's, it's in the chain. <laughs> it's entangled in the chain. Uh, uh, so it's, it's in between. So I think we'll have to remove it. It just may make more sense to leave those at least until the two red maple, uh, the two maples reach a um, more significant size. Oh, okay. uh, um, we, I'm sorry, Bill. If we look at slide number three, just to If we enlarge that bottom left uh, photo, I, I don't see that tree in this photo. I think I think the tree is behind the photo. Off the photo, yeah. Okay. You you, you okay. have the row of trees that you showed on, you know, that go that are on the neighbor's property right along the fence by the house, and I think that's the last of those because okay. it the tree. These trees are not as substantial as that one tree that's, you know, that's, I'll call it, you know, that, that tree. Right. I, th I think we could agree to leave that until the red maples are established. I think you're right. Okay. Um, I want to go back to the engineer's memo, but maybe we can do that without actually looking because most of them, uh, number three was whether the plantings are suitable for rain gardens. And my understanding, Paul, was that you confirmed based on uh, recommendations for rain gardens that the plantings were appropriate. Is that correct? That, that's correct. Um, the fourth one was um, that the township reserved the right to require modification to the lighting for six months after a CO is issued. Um, to verify that the uh, lighting is not impacting the neighboring properties. And my understanding, Mr. Trevulak, is you've agreed to that as a condition. Um, yes, that's what uh, Mr. Anderson provided in his letter. So yes, it's been agreed to. And, and that um, you'll obtain the required road opening permit and that you'll get the soil conservation certification. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Okay. Um, I have one other thing I wanted to cover, but it's lost from my brain, so we'll forget about it. Um, okay, um, we're going to open it up now to members of the public. If there are any members of the public who have questions on the architectural plans, um, now um, it's your opportunity, or if you're watching on the Montclair YouTube channel or on channel 34, um call in on the number that's on the screen there um which would be the 1408-418-9388 number in the access code um this is, so we're going to unmute all the microphones if you want to call in call in quickly but we'll um provide an opportunity if there's anyone with questions for either of these witnesses this is your opportunity to ask
and I mean, my understanding is in terms of people participating on WebEx, it's the applicant and us and the applicant's witnesses and that's it, is that correct? Correct. Okay, and I think I've stalled long enough, so if anyone wanted to call, they've had enough opportunity to dial in. Um, so, Mr. Trembulak, if you want to call your next witness. Yes, my next and last witness is George Williams. Mr. Williams, would you raise your right hand to you swear to tell the truth in the matter pending before the board? Uh, good evening, commissioners. I do, but I note that my video is not being picked up yet. While we're waiting, can you just give us your name and address, please? Certainly. Good evening again, commissioners. My name is George Weedle Williams. My address is 105 Grove Street, suite number three in Montclair, New Jersey. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm offering Mr. Williams as an expert in the field of professional planning. I know he's testified before this board on a number of occasions. We, are his qualifications acceptable? Yes, and as well as he's an alumni of the board. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, George, you want to um, uh, review the application and the subject property and then uh, eventually talk about the variances that are being requested as part of this application? Certainly. Again, good evening, everybody. It's always difficult to follow Paul and, and Rick and an uh, applicant who loves Montclair as much as I do, but I'll, I'll try to, to be fairly brief. Um, I did review the master plan and the zoning ordinance. Uh, some of the case law and literature in support of the release we're seeking. And of course, I did review your board planners uh, reports of which there were, were two. Um, I know the meeting did not begin the last time, but I was present for the originally scheduled hearing as well. You've heard a uh, great detail testimony from uh, Mr. Sionis already, um, but just for the record, again, this is property commonly referred to as 48 Walnut Street and identified in the municipal tax records as block 4308, lot number eight. It's located in the township's R2 uh, two family residential district, uh, and it is an irregularly shaped lot with approximately 13,388 square feet. As you know, uh, it has it is developed with a three family dwelling, and that's the purpose of our application this evening. The R2 district does not include amongst the enumerated permitted uses three family uh, dwellings. Instead, it's one and two family dwellings that are permitted. So you'll hear me speak about the release in a moment, uh, looking for both the D2 variants for uh, permission to expand, uh, change the existing non conforming use, and what I would contextualize as a relatively minor height varies, uh, and I'll provide those citations in a moment. Um, in terms of the uh, intention of the application, you've heard from the applicant, it is to improve significantly both the building aesthetic and the site layout, uh, and her intention is to live on property, which is currently not the case. Uh, so you'll have the benefit of a um, uh, property owner on the site, and then, of course, the substantial investment in this property to bring it uh, not only up to code, but to make it um, harmonious with the surrounding uh, land development patterns. Um, in terms of the impact on the surrounding uh, neighborhood, Mr. Sionis really uh, did a good job of describing the improvements, again, both to the site and to the building. Given that testimony in my review of the site plan application, I would say, generally speaking, that the proposed enhancements, uh, change, or intensification to the pre existing non conforming use not only will benefit the applicant and her use of the property, but the surrounding um, uh, neighborhood as well, particularly given what I'm going to call very generally speaking, I apologize, Paul, uh, the cleanup of the building and the site. The building cleanup is a nod to uh, the architect's intention to uh, harken back to its original design. And I think that's captured in your board planner's report as well. The site layout 
uh, includes a number of improvements such as the rain garden and landscaping and lighting, but also the paving uh, uh, of the parking lot so that it's more um, maneuverable than it currently is and has a more appropriate layout. Um, it's difficult to follow the um, site plan exhibit that was proposed or shared by Mr. Sionis, but if I may, I would just like to share my exhibit purely for the purpose of giving a bit more context to the remainder of my testimony. And I thank uh, board planner for helping out. Yeah, just, just let me know if you'd like me to pull up. It's um it's a exhibit uh kind of a PDF storybook format. It's uh, images from the uh, townships land use documents as well as images captured by myself and my staff when we were on the site and walking the neighborhood. I'm sorry. Was was this provided? Was this sent to us? It, it was for prior to the original hearing. Let me see if I can find that. And if not, I should be able to access it on my end. Um, let's see. Oh, I do have it. I, I do have it. Okay. Sorry, I'm pulling it up now. I was going to say we can even forego it because you've seen a fair amount already. Um, should we have that marked? A2? Yes, that's what we're up to. Okay. And just explain what that is, George, and then you can, I guess, proceed to discuss it. Certainly, Council. This is a, a relatively uh, low tech, straightforward exhibit. Again, a number of images, um, some of which are taken directly from the township land use documents, and the others are images captured on our site inspection. Okay. I believe it's about six or seven uh, pages. Okay. okay. Moving okay. on. Um, next slide, please. Uh, commissioners, this is just an aerial view of the site, giving you a sense of its location um, in the surrounding land development context. You can see the um, cul-de-sac at the rear and the senior housing to the left. And then to the right, there are a variety of housing typologies, and I'll get into that uh, in a few moments. But at least at this slide, the aerial view gives you a sense of the irregular shape of the lot and the size of the lot. Next slide, please. Um, again, taken directly from the municipal land use documents, this is simply a uh, slide that verifies that we are indeed in the R2 family zone district. Our property um, identified with the dashed dotted lines, but again, you can see the proximity to the uh, senior housing complex to the left and the rest of the surrounding to the tax block uh, is all squarely in the R2 district. Next slide, please. And I appreciate the assist. Uh, slide number four is just a capture of the existing three family uh, home. You've seen this already in um, other, I'm sorry, this is 48 Walnut Street. Uh, and you've seen this in the exhibit that was provided by uh, Mr. Sionis uh, previously. Um, just to note, there are, and this has been mentioned in prior testimony, and I'm sure you all are familiar, there's some artificial grass on the site gravel uh, on a site, um, some boarded basement windows, all of these features will be um, improved if the board were to uh, um, approve our application. Uh, also, you'll note there's no uh, formal parking arrangement on the site. Next slide. Slide number five is a picture of 57 Walnut. Uh, I'm going to apologize to the board up front uh, and say that I did not include the tax records. Uh, so I will just veer uh, at this point anecdotally that the next few slides you will see are of what appear to be uh, three family homes. That's only significant in the context of uh, my testimony a little bit later about the negative criteria and the um, impact or detriment to the public good. Um, you're going to hear me say that there will be no substantial detriment to the public good in part because of the land development pattern in this area, which does include other three family homes. Next slide, please. 
again, similarly, uh, okay. this is 45 Walnut. It too appears to be, uh, well, it's located across the uh, front of property and appears to be a four family home based on our field observation with the mailboxes and doorbells. And this is also in the far two zone district. Similar roof pitches as well. Next slide, please. And I think that's it. Last slide is just a capture of uh, 26, 36 Walnut. Um, and uh, it too appears to be a three family home. Uh, but just to give you context about the land development pattern in the immediate vicinity. And that would conclude the exhibit. But I, again, I know you know this area as well as I, just to give you a bit more context for the remainder of my testimony, which will focus on the proofs. And with that, I think we can put the exhibit down unless commissioners have questions. Go on with your planning testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So as this board uh, knows for the relief of, for a um, proposed expansion, intensification or change of a non-conforming use, a pre-existing non-conforming use, the municipal land use law requires the granting of a D2 variance. Uh, and the D2 variance takes much of its context from the landmark Burbage court case, which allows the board to consider um, the criteria with greater liberality, meaning it's a bit different than a wholly new non-conforming use. And the presumption is that it does not rise to the same level of scrutiny because it has existed uh, for a considerable amount of time in the context of the surrounding land development pattern. Um, there is a oft quoted uh, passage from Judge Clifford in the Burbridge court case. I'm just going to read that quickly to the record because I think it adds um, some flavor to uh, the proofs that are required under the municipal land use law. And he quotes, when a lawfully created pre existing non conforming use cannot be eliminated, a municipality may and should see to harmonize the use with its environs. To this end, the municipality ought to require aesthetic improvement as a condition of expansion, a municipality's ability to insist on specific changes as part of the expansion safeguards the general welfare. Uh, this board has already suggested several potential uh, conditions of approval, uh, and I'm certain that the applicant would be more than willing to uh, comply with those, and I'll get back to those in a moment. In my opinion, based on the testimony you've heard uh, from Mr. Sanis, my review of the application, the matter before you is spot on with Burbridge in as much as the intent is to improve not only the building, but the site and to create a more harmonious fit for this building and site with the surrounding area. Uh, and I rely on or remind the board of the testimony very specific to the architectural uh, vision of the design team. Parking back again to the historic features and making a commitment to improving both materials and, um, and landscaping, building materials and landscaping. For the proofs, as this board knows, both the positive and negative criteria must be met. Again, uh, under Burbage with greater liberality, but still we must show that if you were to grant this relief, it would advance the purposes of zoning uh, and that on the balancing side, a two-pronged test, that there be no substantial detriment to the public good, which I referred to earlier on in my testimony. The second prong is no substantial impairment to the zone plan. In terms of the purposes of zoning, I would submit to the board that if you were to grant this relief, a D2 variance, um, subsection A of the purposes of zoning would be advanced. Subsection A, as you know, is to encourage municipal action to guide the appropriate use or development of all lands in the state in a manner which will promote the health, safety, morals, and general welfare. And this goes right back to the Burbage court case, in my opinion, uh, as a professional planner, that if the improvements that are proposed are approved by this board, uh, that this application would advance that particular purpose of zoning, particularly the general welfare. That is that the aesthetic improvement and site improvements would uh, constitute an improvement, an advancement of the general welfare, excuse me. 
The other <laughs> subsection, um, and I know you knew this was coming, subsection I, which is to promote a desirable visual environment through good civic design. In my professional opinion, as a planner, both aspects of subsection I would be advanced if you were to approve this application. The first and most obvious is the aesthetic, uh, and that aesthetic improvement, in my opinion, would be both for what is proposed for the building itself, uh, but I would go a bit further and submit to the board that the site layout um, would also evidence good civic design. And I know I need to touch on that a bit more in the conditions, but uh, for this moment, I would submit that both improvements would advance the subsection I. And those improvements, uh, commissioners, would not only benefit the client or the applicant, but in my opinion, the overall community, because it would take what is currently a building that looks like it's in a state of disrepair and improve it significantly again, along with the site layout as well. Uh, there were a couple of um, potential conditions. Um, I'll just talk about those briefly before I get to the negative criteria. You've heard me mention that the site layout would be an improvement. Uh, certainly, if the board required um, additional documentation about uh, maneuverability uh, or uh, height calculations, that is certainly something um, that the applicant could easily provide to the board as a condition of approval. And lastly, the condition might also include uh, the retention of the two trees referenced in the earlier deliberation until the uh, maples mature. Under the Burbage court case, those would all be what I would submit are reasonable um, conditions of approval. In terms of the negative criteria, now getting to the two prongs I mentioned a moment ago, in my professional opinion, based on all the testimony you've heard thus far, my review of the site and the application, um, there would be no substantial detriment to the public good. And that word substantial comes directly from the municipal land use law. And as you've heard me mention in my introductory comments, under the Burbage court case, this board can consider the negative criteria with greater liberality because this is a pre existing, not conforming use. So, from my perspective as a professional planner, certainly no substantial detriment. I would argue, in fact, that if you were to approve this application, there would be no detriment to the public good, but rather the um, opposite. That is, taking a building that is uh, less than aesthetically pleasing and creating something that would be an asset not only to, again, the applicant, but to the surrounding neighborhood because of the design team's focus on materials uh, and roof pitches um, and not to the historic um, uh, character of that building. The site layout also would be an improvement so that some of the uh, conditions that exist now would be um, improved significantly. And so from a street perspective or street view, the site itself would now um, contribute to the overall character of the neighborhood in a good way. So again, in my opinion, no substantial detriment to the public good. The second prong is substantial impairment to the zone plan. Again, for this pre existing not conforming use, I would submit certainly no substantial impairment to the zone plan. And I would go a bit further and say that there'd be no impairment to the zone plan. Despite the fact that we are seeking relief, uh, uh, the proposed changes um, would not impair the zone plan. In fact, there are several aspects of the zone plan that might actually be uh, advanced if you were to grant our relief. One, some of them are the objectives in the end use element. Uh, number three is to promote and protect existing residential character um, and form in established neighborhoods. Uh, you've heard me mention previously that if you grant these reliefs, in my opinion, you would not only protect, but you would improve neighborhood character given the existing conditions and what's being proposed. Uh, is much better than what is there currently. Enable a continued diversity of housing types. Um, the diversity is a existing diversity. I know this is a R2 district. We're here for the D2 variants, but as you heard me mention uh, previously, there are examples of other three family homes in the immediate vicinity. Um, this diversity would continue. Uh, we don't exacerbate it. Uh, we just make an improvement to the existing condition. 
Finally, housing objective number four, recognize the unique character of each residential district by um, uh, designing zoning regulations, which preserve and enhance the character. Again, um, taking a bit of liberty with that objective, but I would submit to the board that if you were to grant our relief, uh, we would indeed recognize the unique character of this section of the R2 district and actually enhance um, its character by um, granting the, the the improvements. Commissioners, that's the proofs for the D2 variance in my professional opinion. That would leave us with uh, what I'm going to characterize as a relatively minor height variance. I know there has been um, some discussion about the um, uh, height calculations. Again, I'm sure the applicant is willing and able to submit additional calculations if required by the board, but as you heard uh, our design team mentioned, um, existing uh, height at its greatest roof line, 37 inches. What's being proposed uh, as part of our addition is another height uh, line uh, or roof line of 35 feet, eight inches. Um, again, I characterize that as a relatively minor um, excess in the context of a pre-existing non-conforming use because, again, the building already exceeds the height. So what's been done by our design team is to try and match the existing 35-foot, 8-inch uh, roof lines. And so um, relatively minor in that context. The proofs for this would be, in my opinion, the C2 uh, context, and that requires um, a showing that uh, grounded in the purposes of zoning again, uh, that the proposed uh, deviation from your standard is a better zoning alternative than a strict application of your code, and then that the um, same negative criteria met no substantial detriment to the public good. Um, my opinion, subsection I would be the purpose of zoning to be advanced if you were to grant our height. Experience. Um, the aesthetic design, you heard significant testimony from the architectural team about why that height was chosen and more importantly, how that height would comport with the um, existing uh, roof lines and pitches on the structure. Um, in terms of the negative criteria, because uh, the test is to make sure that what we are proposing does not offend the purpose of the height variance, uh, I would submit again, given the existing height standards for this building, uh, that we would not offend the um, purpose of the height standards. In fact, we've got plenty of room on this lot because it's a uh, irregularly shaped lot and large lot that we would not um, impact any light or air if you were to uh, access, if you were to grant our request of relief for the height. Um, I'll stop there and submit that, uh, in my professional opinion, there are more than adequate proofs for both the D2 variance that's being requested to um, uh, enlarge the existing, pre existing non conforming use and for the relatively minor height variance. Okay. Thank you, George. No further questions. Okay. Um, Mr. Church, do you have any questions for the Mr. Williams? Am I muted? Yeah. Hello? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, no, I have no questions. Okay, Mr. Moore, do you have any questions? No questions. That was uh, quite thorough. Okay, Mr. Simon, do you have any questions? No questions. Okay, Ms. Harris, do you have any questions? No, thank you. Okay, Ms. Mr. Vieira, do you have any questions? Uh, no questions, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I don't have any questions for this witness, but I did unfortunately remember the, what I couldn't remember before. Um, I want to go back to the two air conditioning units on the uh, west side of the house that uh, I think Mr. Simon was asking about. Um, which of those is serving the third floor unit? Did we lose? No. Is Rick still here or Paul? I'm, I'm here, but yeah, I'm here too. Okay. 
So which of those two is serving the third floor unit? Um, our, my assumption was that um, the two in the rear yard of unit two would serve unit two. The one in the rear yard of unit one would serve unit one. And the one um, kind of next to the trash enclosure would serve unit three. And the other one by the garage would also serve unit one. Okay, and I, I guess that's the one I've concerned. I, my assumption is the the one by the trash enclosures is effectively screened by the trash enclosures. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so, but there's nothing screening the one um, by the garage. Is that correct? That's correct. And I'm going to go back to the question Mr. I believe it was Mr. Simon was asking as why are you putting it there versus having them back to back like you have for unit two? Um, well, you know, the further they are away from the unit, the less efficient, you know, the interior unit, the less efficient they are. So, you know, by placing that one there, we thought we'd get closer to where the third unit, third floor unit potentially would be. Um, but we certainly could move the one that's near the garage to you know, where the uh, one is behind the trash enclosure, put those yeah. two together. I mean, I just think that would be a more logical location. I mean, the trash enclosures are not going to be particularly attractive, but there is some noise from the units which would, would be screened. I I just think that's that's a better location for that is. Um, okay, so we're now going to open this up to um, the public, if you either have questions for Mr. Williams on his testimony, or if you have any statements, um, comments, testimony, anything you want to say about the application, this is your opportunity. If you're watching on the Montclair YouTube station or on the TV 34, um, please call in quickly to the 1408 number that's on the screen um, there. Um, and Call the number, put in the access code, um, try and do that relatively quickly, but we'll wait wait a minute or two to give people a chance to dial in if you have an interest in doing that. And it's correct, we still have no members of the public on the WebEx, is that correct, Tommy? That's correct. So we'll give again, if you're watching on TV 34, the YouTube channel, and you have either questions or testimony or anything whatsoever you want to say about the application, uh, this is your opportunity to do it, but please dial in quickly. Okay. I assume Tommy, no one has done that. Tommy, have we gotten any calls? No, sorry, I had to turn my headphones off for a second, but no, no call. Okay. Um, okay, Mr. Trembulak, do you want to sum up? Um, yes, my first maybe ask the uh, the board for a short five minute. Um, uh, okay, so you can decide whether you want to proceed or not. Yes, yes. Okay. If I could just have five minutes to speak with my client, I think we're going to proceed. But I'd like to speak with her first. So okay, we'll we'll take a five minute break and or I can. Alan, are you? Yeah, I'm still here. Do you want? I don't want to. Can you do this and not lose yourself from the meeting? Oh, yeah, I'm just, I'm, yeah, I'm just going to mute myself. Okay. And, um, I guess, is there any reason we can't proceed to discuss the annual reports while you're doing that? Certainly fine by me. <laughs> okay. okay. Just, just tell us when you're back on. Will do. All right. Thank you. Um, 
just have to bear with me while I retrieve the annual reports. Started the meeting with. Okay, we have the annual report for the 2020 year because we did not do that last year. Um, I just have a couple of changes which will annoy Tommy because I already looked at these. Um, num on page two, number four, um, even though they're both ultimately tied to height of buildings and number of stories, I think it would be better to separate the two things into, so one is dealing with the half story issue and one is dealing with the basement first floor issue. So just make that the first sentence um, one and then I'm sorry, add a we, second number. Are we, looking at, are we looking at 2020? Yes, but it's the same comment on 2021, but yes, we're looking at 2020. And so just is, sorry, page two, you said number four. And okay. Um, and then just instead of starting the second, the new number within addition, just say the ordinance should be clarified on when the floor above grade is considered a separate story. Okay. And then I believe, unless I missed it, we had the administrative appeal, but then in the application summary, I don't think that's listed. Do you know the address? I can look up the case number and add it. Well, that was the Moranis appeal. No, that no, this was this was the it was on. Orange Road, right off of Bloomfield Avenue, the property owner was contesting a determination by the administrative officer, you know, right by the hotel site. But I cannot give you the number. Um, okay, I'll I'll look into that and see if I can figure out. Uh, if not, I can I can retrieve in my brain, but I. You should be able to find it. Um, Mr. Okay. Sharon said it was yeah. or an orange road address. Yeah, and and uh, Richard Sharon, we were it was appeal of his decision. He should be able to tell you if okay. you can't readily find it. Does anyone else have any changes to the 2020? Um, annual report. Um, it, it, I have it, not so much a change as a question. Um, did we ever rec make recommendations regarding the demolition? Oh, I re vaguely remember uh, a document that went around that we would we discussed or were supposed to discuss. I don't know if that was a formal um, recommendation that was submitted. We did not. Um, I mean, this related to the appeal we did. No, this was I, it. It initially came out, I think, with the Lloyd Avenue, way back when they first started to discuss oh. the demolition or uh, demolition uh, ordinance. Yeah, and uh, we had asked for some clarification because there wasn't nothing in place. Uh, so I just didn't see that either report. Yeah, I didn't yeah, know if that yeah, was the, the the township subsequently revised the ordinance, which is how the um application we got last year came to us. So I believe not saying that revision to the ordinance, but the ordinance was revised uh, in response in part to the concerns we had raised um, concerning that situation. So it's that the the or they revised the ordinance. So what happened on the Lloyd Road situation could not happen again. Um, so that that was in fact addressed. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any any other changes to the 2020 recommendations? Okay, someone want to 
Bill, are we going to, we had a discussion at one point about this, the MLUL requires you right. to. And so, I mean, my assumption is the same way if we move ahead with um, this application tonight, that we would take a vote tonight and then you would have a resolution prepared for our next meeting, same way we do with applications. That I can, yeah, I can do that. That's, that's fine with me. Mike, is that okay? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, or you could just carry the whole thing with the changes in it. So you've got one piece and the resolution's right in front of everybody. It's up to the chairman. Okay, so, okay, that's fine. It, you'll, you'll make the, um, Tommy, you'll make the changes, put them in the packets. We'll have a resolution and we'll do everything together. That's fine with me. Okay. Um, okay. Alan, are you ready to proceed? Yes, we are, Mr. Chairman. And okay, you, uh, do you want to proceed tonight? Yeah, we've decided we would like to um, uh, proceed and uh, ask the vote to decide the application this evening. Um, so just by way of summation, um, you know, I think one of the most important things to me um, about this evening is that there were no members of the public um, in attendance at the meeting to voice any concerns or any objections. And I think that speaks volumes, and I think there's a good reason for it. I mean, if I lived in this neighborhood, I would look at what's being proposed here and see nothing but improvements, not obviously dramatic improvements to the property, but that also has an, a, a benefit to the neighborhood and the surrounding community whose properties would be benefited by having this um, you know, somewhat un, unappealing property, I say that in the hope of not offending my client, but a property that, um, uh, you know, hasn't been very well maintained um, and, um, you know, has a number of conditions that are not uh, beneficial to the neighborhood, um, including exterior uh, consisting of aluminum siding, a front lawn with artificial turf and, and gravel, um, gravel driveways, a lot of pavement in the rear of the property. Um, all of those conditions are going to be um, improved, eliminated and or improved by what's being proposed here um, with new lawn areas in the front, as well as creating lawn areas in the rear of the property for the residents, which really don't currently exist. Uh, a better parking layout, parking, a num the, number of parking spaces um, in compliance with what the uh, zoning ordinance and RSIS requires. Um, just um, nothing but improvements uh, as, as uh, Mr. Williams testified to um, uh, in his um, testimony this evening. Um, I think it's, it's also, I think, with, important to point out that with the exception of the eight inch height variance, the plan before you complies with all of the bulk requirements for the R2 zone. Um, there's no other uh, uh, variances that are being requested. And that includes building coverage. And I, um, I say that in response to Ms. Harris's concerns, wh which I understand. I mean, it is fairly significant. Um, uh, expansion of this building. However, it, it's an expansion within the limitations of the zoning ordinance. The zoning ordinance allows for 25% building coverage in the R2 zone, and this plan provides for 24.75% coverage, um, you know, in compliance. Um, if this were not a uh, a, th a three family house, but rather a two family house and someone was coming before you with this or someone wanted to improve the house exactly as we're uh, proposing, with the exception of the height variance, they could simply apply for building permits because all the zoning requirements uh, are being met here. You know, we're not expanding into uh, required setbacks or violating any other zoning or any other uh, ordinances. There is no limitation in the R2 zone for uh, total impervious coverage, um, but the coverage is only being increased from roughly 44% to 54%. Uh, 
Uh, and again, with a lot of additional green space being provided, even though we're adding some blacktop and, and, and additional building coverage, um, there's a lot of landscaping improvements uh, that are also being proposed. So as you know, Mr. Uh, Williams pointed out, you know, the Burbage case, um, you know, is, is directly on point here. We're dealing with the expansion of a non-conforming use as an existing use. We're not asking for permission to put a three family in a two family zone. Uh, that condition has existed on this property for uh, you know, upwards of 80 years or so. Um, we're just asking permission to really beautify this building, uh, improve the building, improve the property to the benefit of not only the property owner, but also to the neighborhood, as I've indicated earlier. It's hard to conceive of any uh, possible detriments uh, to the neighborhood. And as I said, uh, no neighbors uh, appear tonight to express any concerns about what's being proposed. Um, I, I think we've um, agreed to all the uh, conditions that have been um, suggested, including uh, um, maintaining the uh, the two trees that were identified until the red maple trees are established, um, the conditions that Mr. Um, Williams mentioned in his testimony, uh, again, we've agreed to comply with all of the requirements uh, and um, conditions cited by the board's engineers. Um, you know, if the board feels it's necessary, we can provide uh, turning templates um, to show that vehicles can maneuver um, out of the driveway as testified to by Mr. Jarzembowski. So um, for all those reasons, and I guess I should just mention the height variance. I think it's, it, it's, it's, it's a de minimis variance. Um, the height we're proposing is less than the existing height. And again, the reasons for it were explained. I mean, clearly we could comply um, with 35 foot if the board required it, but um, um, you know, we're trying to match the existing um, roof lines, and so we think it's a better um, result architecturally and therefore um, appropriate for a C2 variance. So um, for all of those reasons, I would uh, respectfully request that the board grant the two variances and as well as the site plan approval. And finally, again, thank everyone for coming out tonight for a special meeting to hear this application. Okay, uh, we'll start discussion with Mr. Church. Mr. Church, we're not hearing you. Uh, you can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, sorry. Sorry, um, the um, I have uh, no problem with the application. I, I looked at the property, I walked on the property, and I watched. I walked around the neighborhood. It's certainly what is being proposed is certainly an improvement to that property. Uh, it is in dire need of what's being proposed. I believe it's also a uh, an improvement to the overall neighborhood and to the uh, uh, general appearances that we like to see in Montclair of, of older homes that we have in this town and how they are improved and, and made uh, whole again after, after uh, a lot of years uh, of construction. So I would be absolutely in favor of this application. I, I believe that the architect did a wonderful job in, in providing uh, a good plan. And uh, I hope that it, it goes forward as uh, presented. So I vote in favor of it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Mr. Moore. I echo uh, our colleague, uh, Mr. Church. I'm also in favor of the application. And I believe that uh, this will be 
uh, it'll bring additional value uh, to the area and um, also to the actual site. So thank you for your hard work. Hey, Mr. Simon. Um, I, I'm in favor. Uh, I think it's uh, an improvement to the property. Um, other than the, the minor changes we suggested about the AC units uh, being moved, um, I would vote in favor. Ms. Harris? Um, I'm in favor of the application of granting the requested variances. Um, I don't believe the height um, variance is, um, is extreme at all um, by any stretch of the imagination. I do think there is too much bulk being added, added to the building, but to Mr. Chairman's last point, um, it does meet all of the bulk um, requirements and the zoning um, ordinance. So um, I don't believe I have a basis to uh, reject that variance. So I would be in favor. Okay, Mr. Vieira. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm also in favor of this application. I think the uh, applicant has, um, you know, showed a, a, a huge improvement to uh, the existing conditions of the property. Um, in addition, I'm, I'm also satisfied with the engineer's um, calculations and the uh, proposed um, uh, garden uh, in the front to offset some of the additional um, stormwater uh, due to the impervious coverage increase. Uh, so I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of this application. Thank you. I'm also in favor of the application. I think um, this will be a significant improvement to the property, uh, both in terms of replacing the interesting current landscaping in the front of the property with real landscaping and uh, vastly improving how the rear and side of the property looks. Um, I think, um, you know, in terms of the D2 variants, uh, the applicant has certainly met the proofs for um, expanding an existing non-conforming use. Um, as other members have said, the height variance is really a de minimis increase and it's less than the current maximum height of the building. Um, I think, um, you know, that this is not only not going to be a substantial detriment to the public good, this will be um, these improvements if implemented will be a positive contribution to the neighborhood. And I think given um, other non-conforming uses in the area and the fact that this has been a non-conforming use for decades, uh, it's not going to be a substantial detriment to the zone plan. It's a three family now. It um, will be a three family. Um, like to do the following conditions that they adhere to conditions four through six of the engineers March 2nd, 2022 memo uh, that the large tree along the east side property line next to the current parking area be retained for at least two years until the later of two years have gone by and two years from when the uh, proposed red maples in the rear are planted and until those trees have become established um, that the applicant provide turning radiuses to the board's engineer showing all parking spaces will be able to exit the uh, property facing forward onto um, Walnut Street, um, the consequence of that, if they can, is they're going to have to come back and we're going to have to address that, um, but presumably they can, um, that they move the air conditioning unit that's currently next to the proposed garage, either to behind the trash enclosures or to piggyback in the rear yard of lot one, wherever between those two space places they want to put it and that they provide to the board secretary a copy of the revised architectural plans that were seemingly provided to the board engineer but not to the board so they are in the board's file and we have the correct plans to look at when the they come in for their construction drawings um, 
Any further discussion among board members? If not, would someone like to move approval of the application? I'll make that motion, Mr. Chairman. I move approval of the application with the provisos just so stated by the chair. Uh, and I wait a second. Okay, is there a second? A second. Okay, um, Tommy, you want to call the roll? Mr. Church? Yes. Uh, Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Simon? Yes. Mr. Harrison? Yes. Ms. Harris? Yes. Mr. Vieira? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much for giving me the chance to come back to Montclair. <laughs> okay. Please move forward quickly. <laughs> Thank you. Yep, now that's the goal. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, we have the uh, board's recommendations for 2021. I have a um, couple of changes to that. On page one, um, you need to add in the summary the appeal from the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, on page uh, to the same change to number four that we did on uh, the 2020 recommendation on page four. Um, on the Dakota Plofka application under the, you know, where you're doing 70C, 70D, I mean, I think uh, even though this was just to revise, ultimately the revisions were tied to a 70C variant. So I think it's, that should be listed. And then um, on page five, same, same issue of NA and they, they receive C variances. Okay. Um, you know, we denied the one, but there were other variances they received. Okay. Anyone else with any changes to those, um, that recommendation? Okay. So we'll, you'll make the revisions and we'll have a resolution and we'll formally adopt that at our hopefully next meeting. Um, now I'm going to do a little discussion of real per in person meetings versus virtual meetings which lead to inconsistent results but then if anyone else have comments but um so i am still not unnervous about the now omicron variant that seems to be increasing caseload so much related to that is last fall there were a number of boards that decided it was safe to resume in person meetings and then Omicron came along in December and they switched course and this caused massive confusion for board members, applicants, everybody when you suddenly switched and I don't wanna switch back to in person until we're reasonably confident that we're gonna stay in person and not three months later suddenly go back to virtual meetings. Inconsistent with those two comments is I've also observed, and I'll tell you a little incident of, it is very confusing when some boards, governing bodies and towns are meeting in person and other boards are meeting virtually. I actually had a situation in a town where one board was meeting in person, one was meeting virtually, where the board we were before was meeting virtually, but I had difficulty persuading our witness that we were really virtual and I had to call the board secretary even to confirm that yes they were still meeting virtually even though the other board so it appears that both the planning board and the governing body are going in person and I don't want to continue indefinitely with us being virtual if they're going to stick with in-person meetings because that does confuse the public and seemingly applicants or their witnesses. Um, um, 
you know, so we're virtual through May. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any comments. Um, you know, I think probably and probably practically the result of what I'm saying is we're going to be virtual through June just because applicants have to provide notice and but you know let's see what the next two weeks bring and um do that i don't know if anyone else has any comments um you know it's it's a very weird world where centers for disease control says based on transmission rates in new jersey you can go running around in mass without masks but I'm still wearing a mask in a lot of public places because we seem to be increasing numbers and a lot of people in Montclair are, but there's another part of me that, you know, these meetings are very frustrating. We've had a situation with the application, I think it was on Upper Mountain with the garage where we had members of the public who couldn't connect, ended up going to their neighbor's house, so we did get to hear them, but we don't know how many other people have not been able to connect. We had a witness on the bank conversion in Wachung Plaza who couldn't connect and she was able to communicate with the applicant, but that's because she was supporting the application. So I am nervous about situations where we, there are people who want to participate, but haven't been able to. Um, you know, Mr. Tremulak last meeting had, pro and even this meeting had a problem initially connecting. And it's one thing when it's the applicant's attorney and, you know, I've had representing clients. I had a witness, there was a thunderstorm by where she, you know, she was obviously testifying virtually and she was asked a question by the board chair at the exact moment her electricity was knocked out by a lightning bolt, but it seemed like she was trying to avoid the board chair's question and it was a very awkward moment um the so you know i don't know if anyone else has any comments i you know it's um but you know we're not changing course at the moment so can I ask a question? Um, is the planning board and the governing body, have they already returned to in-person meetings? I believe they're starting in April. Tommy, do you know for sure when they? I believe May. Okay. So we'll see if they actually do that. Um, Bill, and... the Board of Education is already meeting. Right. Uh, in in person right and they've been doing it for about three weeks yeah three months so yeah, i know I, it's, it's a little different um because they meet in a different place and that's true I, but i yes I, I do think it is confusing for people if different bodies in town are meeting in different fashions that um to know how you're supposed to participate in any board because a lot of the public doesn't make the distinctions and particularly between the planning board and the board of adjustment as to who is who and who does what and um having meeting differently um but you know as i said i don't want to start meeting in person and a month later have to switch back because we have a new surge or has the building implemented any different cleaning protocols between meetings? Not, not that I know of. Um, again, because we, no one is using the council chambers for public hearings yet. And I haven't heard anything about cleaning protocols once they do resume. Yeah, can, can you find out? And I, I guess where uh, I mean, it, even though we're meeting in the council chambers, um, most you know the council used to meet in you know on the second floor conference room, which is cramped quarters. And we've occasionally had meetings there. Are they planning to meet there? At least in the, unless there's a large group of public there, at least in the council chambers, you can spread people out somewhat better. But if you can find out what protocols they're going to use, I mean. Um, I am, you know, partially for a bunch of those reasons. I'm, I'm not, I'm 
like to see what the what the council does, what the planning board does, and as a practical matter, and um, you know, ultimately, in theory, I'm old and at greater risk, and um, you know, I you know don't want to go into gratuitously unsafe conditions, but it would be good to know that. Um, you know, if the council's meeting on a Tuesday night, there are some cleaning protocols in place before we meet on the next on the next night. Um, oh, I'll look into that. I'll ask around, and if I find anything out, I'll let you know. Okay. Any other comments? Um, just another question: Do we know if, if masks are still required in the municipal building? Would we have to wear masks at the hearing? Or not. They're not required currently. And proof of vaccination cards? Not required. I mean, I, I understand the chair's concerns about a possible surge. Um, the thing is, it's, it's just really hard to predict when that's going to happen. You know, we could go back and then some, all summer we're fine and September, October, November, you know, there's another surge. So, yeah, and, and I, you know, I have the same concern. I mean, I really do not want to go back and switch back to virtual meetings X, you know, a few months later. I, um, you know, I, I mean, there really was in times where that happened last fall and winter, there really was chaos in terms of knowing where and how a meeting was going to happen. So am comments? I clear am I clear that and we're we're staying virtual through Jim? We're, we're due to notice we're staying we're staying definitely staying virtual through May. I think the practical reality is I'd like to see what happens with the council and the planning board which probably means we're virtual through June. Um, but, um, you know, let's, you know, we, we at least have the next meeting where if for some reason we want to switch, we can. Um, but I think the reality is we're virtual through June and, you know, it, and by the May meeting, we're going to have to make a decision what we want to do during the summer. Okay, any other discussion? And if not, someone want to make a motion to adjourn? I'll make the motion. Is there a second? Second. One favor, say aye. 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 Okay. See you in a couple of weeks. We'll have a nice agenda. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.